Welcome to the SpartanMag.com VCast. Jim Comperoni, Paul Kondrak, Jason Killip. Signing day, recruiting day. As we uh, head into December, give us a thumbs up here to like the channel. And also subscribe to the channel and go to SpartanMag.com. Become a Spartan Mag subscriber. $1 for a month. You'll get our continued coverage of Michigan State's recruiting class as Michigan State puts this together and continues to add to the roster as Jonathan Smith and his regime begins three weeks into it. I'll talk to Jason first. Um, in my opinion, um, you know, I asked Jonathan Smith if he felt that this class met or exceeded his expectations based on what he was facing the day he took over 22 days ago, 23 days ago, with only two official visit weekends and what he had to do to, to scramble together a class. I think a lot of Michigan State fans on our website have been pleasantly surprised with Michigan State recruiting victories coming down the stretch. I think Michigan State did well to salvage this class. Jonathan Smith said that he felt it, it probably exceeded his expectations. Jason, what are your thoughts about the way this, this class came together as it's come together and uh, signing day with still maybe one or two to add uh, going forward? No doubt. And uh, when, when you rewind a couple weeks ago, um, I was looking at possible routes for Michigan State to get near 20 commitments and to either to get to that point, they almost needed to land every kid that visited campus. And that's about what they did. And I think that's pretty impressive. Um, obviously, the quarterback Tyler Cherry chose Indiana and uh, Francis Brew committed to stuck with his commitment to Pittsburgh. So those are the two big losses of signing day. But other than that, they really hit on everybody that they wanted to bring up to campus for the most part. In the high school class, they, as our readers know, it's a combination of former Michigan State commitments, former Oregon State commitments, and they even went down to Ohio and plucked speedy wide receiver Austin Clay from his Bowling Green commitments. So making some of their own evaluations as long as, long as following some of the old staff Michigan State uh, evaluations. And then when you look at what they did in the transfer portal, it's really impressive adding uh, five guys who have – playing time experience at the uh, high levels of college football. So that's something that you can look to um, competition at those positions with, with each of those transfers at the next level. You know, Jason did a great job covering those recruits as they were rolling in, Paul, and I'm sure that you kept abreast of that also. And Jonathan Smith touched on it today, specifically the Oregon State guys that were committed to Oregon State that weren't from the state of Oregon, but players from out state, a couple of running backs from Texas, Hawaii, Florida, um, those guys, as they came in and visited Michigan State, the Oregon State commitments from Jason's coverage and so forth, they came to Michigan State, they liked it, and Michigan State got every single one of those that they went after. Your thoughts on that? Anything else from today? First off, I want to give Jason props for the, his coverage. It's been fantastic. I mean, every single commitment we've had, there's been a story and then a follow-up story, and Jason's done a great job. And he's had a lot on his plate uh, these past few weeks. And uh, I know after not having a whole lot to cover, he's had – more than his share of stuff to cover, but he's done a great job with that. I, I think one of the things when you look at the Oregon State guys that they brought over, uh, you look at the staff continuity and offense that, that Jonathan Smith brought with him uh, from Oregon State. You know, you've got the offensive coordinator, you've got the running backs coach, um, you know, you've got uh, the offensive line coach. So, you know, obviously Jonathan Smith uh, being the quarterback's coach or his background there. So I think. The guys that they brought over, for the most part, are offensive guys. Now, these guys could play both ways, and I think that's one of the things I like about these guys in comparison to like what we saw during the D'Antonio era. There's a lot more versatility in the guys that they brought in. But in terms of the Oregon State guys, there was always already that relationship uh, with, that they sold those guys on with how they fit within the structure of the of the offense, and, and I think that's kind of the thing that, that stood out to me. And then you look at like Joe Rossi coming in. Well, he brings in Brady Pretzlaff, uh, the, the linebacker from Gaylord that Michigan State totally uh, missed the boat on, should have never been uh, that far off the radar. But, you know, Joe Rossi brings in his guy. And then you've got some, you know, you've got some, some transfer portal guys. You've got a Wisconsin linebacker. So I think the, my takeaway from this is, those Oregon State guys, that's relationship-based recruiting. Brady Pretzlaff coming in, that's relationship-based recruiting with a guy like Joe Rossi, who was in, the, in person to visit him during the recruiting process seven different times going to Gaylord. Uh, you know, Michigan State might have gone up there once. And, uh, and I, I'm not going to say that's no disrespect to Michigan State. It is disrespect to Michigan State because they totally missed the boat on a guy that, that they could win football games with. I go back to the beginning of the D'Antonio era. Eric Gordon wasn't a great linebacker at Michigan State. But he's someone that won games, and uh, and I think Pretzlaff is a better prospect than than Eric Gordon. Eric Gordon had a great career at Michigan State, really thrived under the, uh, under Mark D'Antonio. But when I see Brady Pretzlaff, I see a guy that's a high bat, high football IQ guy, 
He's a guy that comes from a coach's family. Uh, he identifies stuff well, and uh, and he's a weight room warrior. I, I, I really like them getting him. And there's always something about it when you bring in two of the top five players in state. That means a little bit more to me than if uh, – than if you bring in, you know, like one top five player, like a Nick Marsh and not, not a guy on defense. That, that makes this in-state class, um, you know, a little bit better than it would have otherwise, but this is a guy that can help out. And, you know, like I know the other guy that's committed that didn't sign today, but the dude from uh, Jaden Walker, if they can bring in him, then I think they're really doing some good things in-state. And I think they're going to do a lot better stuff in-state moving forward. I agree. We've talked about Brady Pretzloff, um really all season. I mean, that's a guy that um, – I agree with you that it looked like a Michigan State type of guy early on. I wanted to go watch him play this fall just because I wanted an excuse to go up to Gaylord and watch a game in the fall and check him out and all that stuff when he was committed to Minnesota. But I never got a sense that Michigan State was going to be interested in him. Then they kind of did once the Mel Tucker thing shook down. Michigan State fortunate to be able to get in with him and flip him. Like you said, the Rossi thing has something to do with that. We mentioned Pretz laugh because that was the news today. He decommitted from Minnesota a couple of days ago, did not announce his intentions until about 3 o'clock today after Jonathan Smith spoke, spoke. So Jonathan Smith was not able to talk about Pretz laugh today. But you interviewed Pretz laugh's coach last week, right? Yeah. And what did you learn about, about him as you spoke with him? Well, I mean, this is a guy that was instrumental in one of the biggest – turnarounds and pro like of a high school program in the in state in the history of football in the state of Michigan I mean Gaylord was terrible a doormat and uh it's been a long time since they since they went to the playoffs before that coaching staff got there his dad's a defensive coordinator up there that's a guy that is a freshman him and his senior teammates they won one game won two games the next year and then this year um you know one of the best teams in the state he was instrumental in that in that turnaround um high care factor a guy that Always set the tone in the weight room. A guy that worked his tail off nonstop. He's a film junkie. All the, those type of things. And I, I got to say, if if Joe Rossi didn't love that kid, it's ridiculous that he'd be visiting him seven t- seven times in person, mm-hmm. given how difficult it is to get to Gaylord. It's not like going to Atlanta, where you're going to see a kid in high school and you can see 150 other guys. You're going to Gaylord. There's one guy up there that you want to see. And Joe Rossi went and saw Brady Pretzlaff. And I think one of the things that stood how out many, to me. How many times? Seven times. One of the things that stood out to me um, in talking to the high school coach up there is the emphasis that Joe Rossi puts on high character guys, uh, guys that are winners, guys that, that want to put in the work and, uh, and be uh, part of something that's bigger than themselves. And he saw in Pretzlaff uh, the high intangible qualities that he wants in his linebackers. And you can see in some of the linebacker play up there, I mean, they do some, some really nice stuff at Minnesota, or they mm-hmm. did when he was there. Mm-hmm. And I don't know how good Brady Pretzlaff is going to be in that defense, mm-hmm. but he thinks he's going to be good, and uh, that's a good place to start. I know that Minnesota team from two years ago, number 55, Mariano, what's his name? He's on the staff at Minnesota now. Uh, I could see Pretzlaff being that that type of player. And Pretzlaff, you know, interestingly, on three, with the on three rankings, they have Pretzlaff as a four-star. They have him ranked the number four player in the state of Michigan. Now, he, on three takes all the rankings and puts them together for the industry rankings. And he, when you add them all together, he's a three-star. But his, his ranking ranges from number four at on three to number 22 at ESPN. You know, on three now has him as a national number 221 in the country for Brady Pretzlaff. And I don't disagree with that. He's got some physicality, um, got the smarts you're talking about, so a nice addition there. Well, we've talked about Pretzlaff probably enough, but your thoughts about other takeaways about what, what Jonathan Smith said today and what Michigan State did coming down the stretch to finalize this class. I, I, I shouldn't say finalize. Smith said today, like he said in his introductory press conference, that he plans to use the February signing date to add to this and he expects to find some players as he said he's going to be turning over a lot of stones looking for players so they're not done there and he says there's going to be more coming via the portal but your thought your takeaways about what Jonathan Smith said today yeah um and it's interesting that both of the top two highest rated commits according to on three are both in-state recruits from Michigan State as they look to set the foundation there and and then inside of the state and uh and with the walk-on route, Michigan State added a pretty strong walk-on with MAC offers earlier this week out of Wisconsin, and uh, they're about to add another walk-on um, out of Traverse City later today. So Michigan State has some solid options with the transfer. I mean, the walk-on candidates getting guys with MAC offers, lower-level um, 
Mac offers to pay their own tuition and come up to Michigan State. And Michigan State has a lot to sell to walk-ons with uh, Jonathan Smith's story as a walk-on himself and earning the starting role at Oregon State. And then one thing that the Wisconsin linebacker who PWO had committed told me was that Joe Rossi has a history of playing walk-ons on his defense as well. So that's something that intrigued him. So I think Michigan State can be strong in the walk-on market, getting guys who maybe can decide between Michigan State walking on and going down to the MAC with for a scholarship offer. And the more type of guys that you can add like that just only improves depth and positions of need. I think when you look at walk-ons, and like if you go back to what Mark D'Antonio did building the program, I look back at year one, they didn't have any linebacker depth that year. Brandon Denson was a walk-on running back. That's a good dude that no one heard about. D'Antonio took him off the scrap heap, no, no disrespect to him, and turned him into a real linebacker, a guy that could help win. They had another guy from uh, southeastern Michigan in, in Travis Key. I think he was from Monroe. Uh, I'm not quite sure on that, but that's a guy that was, I mean, he was not an NFL player by any means, but but he was a hard-edged safety that would come down and hit you. Uh, you know, if, if he didn't get stretched vertically, he could make some plays on, on the ball and whatnot. But there is a, you know, people don't get excited about walk-ons, but a lot of times these are guys that develop into the kind of the, not just the safety net of the program, but sometimes the Im, impact difference makers. I, I think of, uh, you know, Jonathan Strayhorn. If they didn't have him as a walk-on in that first Antonio recruiting class, um, I believe it was out of Oak Park, but if they don't have him, they're in trouble. That's a guy that developed into some, somebody that could do, do some really, really good things. And you know, throughout that Antonio area, at least the early part when they're building it, they leaned on some of those guys. And what I like about the philosophy is the earned, never given, is that these guys signed, um, but everyone's on equal equal footing and they have an opportunity. And a lot of these guys, that's what they want. They want an opportunity to do it at a Big Ten school. The other thing I think is a selling point is we saw 22 guys leave Michigan State through the portal. Um, I know they're going to try to keep as many as they want, but you look at the at the trends throughout college football with coaching changes. There's going to be more guys that leave um, during spring football, um, you know, that don't quite pan out. There's going to be guys that don't like what's going on in winter conditioning or something like that that leave or wash out. So those guys that are PWOs now uh, might have a chance pretty early in their career if if they put in the work and they show out, they might have a chance to, to be put on scholarship earlier than most. Now Michigan State's got a lot of work to do in the trenches, offensive line, defensive line. Michigan State's class, for what it's worth, right now ranked number 55 in the country, number 12 in the Big Ten out of 14 schools with one four-star um, and, and the industry rankings, that being Nick Marsh. If you put Pretzleff in there, you know I don't think on three does like their own school rankings, and I wonder where that the Pretzleff, a top 250 guy, would nudge them into, into those rankings. They, they go industry rankings, which, I, I, which is one way to do it, but I'd also like to see what on three would do with, if they just don't use the industry rankings. Not that it matters all that much, but I've said this a few times. Top 10 means something, top 15 means something, top 25 means something. But top you know, it, recruiting classes ranked from 26 to 46, in my opinion, they're all the same. Just like when you look at the AP top 25 current rankings, you look at the other schools receiving votes. Is there really much difference between 26 and 34? Not much. There's similar teams. It comes down to like what you say. Are you getting your needs met? And how did you do with evaluation? which we won't know for a few years, and player development, which we won't know for a few years. In general, I think it's important to stay in that top 45, I've said over the years. I put out there a couple of weeks ago that I thought if Michigan State had a top 50 class, that'd be a, that would be a really strong haul. And if they had gotten Tyler Cherry, they would have been top 50. And uh, they end up getting uh, Ryland Jesse at the 11th hour when Cherry went with Indiana. And they didn't get Cherry. It, that was really close. Talking to some people down there, Aiden Childs has a lot to do with that. He comes in as a transfer portal guy with three years of eligibility. Indiana gets a transfer portal with one year of eligibility quarterback. Rourke, the kid from Ohio University. So you're Cherry, you're like, okay, do I go to the school that's got a one-year portal guy or a three-year portal guy? And that tipped the scale. So you get Childs, you don't get Cherry, it all evens out, and they'll get a quarterback next year. But that would have flipped Michigan State into, like, number 45 in the country for what it's worth for a quarterback that uh, Cherry that I thought was pretty good. So in terms of four-star recruits, Michigan State has one. Indiana had one. Maryland had one. Illinois had one. Rutgers had two. Minnesota had three. Purdue had two. Iowa had six. Wisconsin had seven, which is more for them usual than usual. Then you get up in the upper echelon. You know, Nebraska had six, which is they're getting back on track. Then Michigan had 15. Penn State had 13. 
Ohio State had 14 plus four, four, four five star guys. So there's a drop off as there's always been. But Michigan State avoided having like a number 80 recruiting class like they had when, with John L. Smith's first class when he didn't have much time to put something together and there wasn't much left. They salvaged a class that I think is going to be functional. You add the portal to it. And I, I think they've done a really good job in the three weeks, Paul. I think you got to look at the portal, too, just not, Very not, much not so. what they, they've done. But you could not, in my opinion, have done much better than what they did right here. And I you agree. talk about you talk about missing out on Cherry. You bring in, you bring in the, the Ryland kid. Uh, that's a dude that they offered at, at Oregon State. So he's not a reach on, on, on that part. That's a guy that was committed to, to Utah State. It's a guy that they tripped in at Oregon State, offered late in the process. Uh, you know he went with uh, he went with Utah State because because they recruited him as hard as they did. So this isn't a guy this isn't a guy that was uh, you know off the scrap heap type of deal. This is a guy that they had lined up that they liked, and uh, you know you just never know what's going to happen. I, I think the parallel between this quarterback class and it's too early to say if it's going to be like D'Antonio's first quarterback class, but D'Antonio was scrambling around, scrambling around. They ended up bringing Kirk Cousins, Nick very Foles. Very much like, very Nick, much. Nick Foles, um, you know, Keith Nickel ended up coming in. The difference being, the difference being they had Brian Hoyer, an NFL quarterback, already in, you know, in, in-house. But for Michigan State going to having zero quarterbacks in the class to having three in, in the span of two weeks, and three guys that you look at and I watch it, and I'm like, okay, these guys, you can make a case for every single one of them. Childs has obviously got a lot of star power. He's already proven it to an extent at, you know, at, the, at a higher level. He understands the Oregon State offense. It's a perfect situation for a young building team for him to come in. But um, I love the Alessio. I don't know how to pronounce his last name. You do, but uh, I like Milivojevic. 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 And I really like some of his film. I liked what um, Jonathan Smith said about him. In fact, it, you know, like he can do a lot of good things, but then he can throw it downfield as well. And uh, I think he does some really accurate stuff. Uh, I think he plays in a good system. But you look at the, the, the at the Ryland Jesse kid. He plays at one of the biggest schools in uh, you know in the San Diego area, a school that, according to Jason, uh, produces Reggie Bush and Alex Smith. Alex Smith. So and Bill Walton, probably a lot of others too. So maybe he's got the Bill Walton tinge. That's why he's here. I mean, because of pot's legal. But there goes Paul. We don't we don't know. But I mean, he I like I like I liked his frame. I like you know. Obviously, in shorts and T-shirts, you don't know, but he he does some really good things. That is a really, really good late add-on quarterback, and, and it's not like I compare him to some of the guys that that um, that the last staff you know got commitments from. I'm like some of those guys to me, their quarterback reaches, mm -hmm. you know, and you're like, I'll give the quarterbacks coach, the offensive coordinator, uh, some benefit of the doubt because you know he's got supposedly a good, a decent eye for for quarterback talent, but. I think Jonathan Smith, in the time frame that he had, he killed it. I think I, the comparison to the Kirk Cousins year, I think, is on point because Michigan State wanted Keith Nickel, didn't hold on to him. He goes to Oklahoma. Cherry, it was only a three-week commitment, a three-week, two-week co recruitment. He goes to Indiana. He's an Indiana kid and, and for but, reasons we just talked about. So with, when Nickel moves on, Michigan State gets Kirk Cousins and Foles. Uh, Cousins was a two-star guy with a Western Michigan offer. Kind of reminds me of this situation. Michigan State gets Childs in the portal. They had a couple weeks to put it together. Went after a four-star. Came up short. I give them credit for coming real close. Horseshoes and hand grenades, you don't get credit for coming in second in this. But then you go get a couple of flippable, flippable guys. They found the, most, the best flippable guy in the MAC, Milivojevic, and then a flippable guy in the West Coast that they managed to keep secret. Not bad. The other parallel, too, is like you look at what Michigan State did in that quarterback class. Nick Foles came in well after signing day. Yeah. So it was like this is like a, a truncated period. Um, you know, so something yeah, fell through they, with Arizona State, I think it was with, with him. Right. Like Arizona, I believe it was. Arizona. And uh, so they, they had a coaching change. He ended up at Arizona later, but he had. It was there, a, maybe it was Arizona State, but there's a coaching change. Coaching change. Uh, and, uh, and he wasn't comfortable with the situation. So he ended up going to going to Michigan State, but the, the way they put that one together w was pretty impressive. Um, Might have even been an er Dennis Erickson thing. Coming, it was coming, a, it was a Dennis coming full circle. You know who Dennis Erickson's yeah. quarterback was? Jonathan Smith. Go yeah. ahead. Yeah, I mean it was a Dennis, full it was a Dennis Erickson thing. I, they didn't Nick Foles' family didn't trust Dennis er Erickson. And, Is that what it was? Yeah. So, but you know that, that's the thing that that just illustrates what the quarterback position is like. You know, you talk about the Cherry kid, um, you know, being scared—not scared, but leery of Aiden Childs. 
at Indiana, like there's something about being a quarterback. It's not about winning. It's like, okay, Michigan State got its plan A, its absolute stud quarterback in Aiden Childs. Mm -hmm. Indiana got its top wish yeah. at quarterback. But like quarterbacks aren't going to be the, the bridesmaid. You know, they know I mean that's the, the position traditionally before the portal that transferred the most. So they're mm -hmm. not gonna go into a situation where they're not heralded as the guy. And I don't think Michigan State was in a situation where they're gonna blow as much smoke at a at a high school quarterback as uh, Indiana could, saying, you're our guy, you're going to be the guy. What would you think about the quarterback recruitment coming on the stretch? And the Ryland Jesse thing took me by surprise. I give credit to Michigan State for having that in the hopper and keeping that guy warm. Probably had to be honest with him. You know, we're in on a guy in Indiana. If it doesn't fall through, I assume that's how it went down. Yeah, I would assume so, too. And the way things played out, uh, he was on campus over the weekend, and it was very quiet, and I didn't know about it. And I'm sure – Either whether Michigan State asked him to keep it quiet or not, I'm sure that they preferred that he did. Um, this late in the process, you never know if teams out there looking for a quarterback could come in and convince him not to sign today, and he kept it completely quiet. Um, obviously, Michigan State extended a scholarship offer to him at some point, and he didn't post that either. So, that, like I said, that could have boded well for Michigan State with other schools lurking, and um, now they have a three-man quarterback room, and I think that also bodes well with – the way you set up for future classes, um, when if you want to go and try and get a highly ranked like four star type of kid, these guys may not scare him away on the surface, and um, you can you can try to stack quarterback classes. But I really like the two that they brought in, especially the Ball State kid. Um, and now I'll have to check out this quarterback from out west as well. He's say been such a busy day. Yeah. Uh, if you were to talk to a Michigan State fan who hadn't followed recruiting at all these last couple of weeks and uh, or last couple of months, who are one or two guys, before we start talking about transfers, who are one or two guys that caught your eye that maybe we're not talking about a whole lot that th through your research and your interviews that you think are, are intriguing guys as part of this class? Yeah, I like a lot of the Oregon State commitments that came over following Jonathan Smith and the staff. A lot of those guys had their recruitments go kind of under the radar a little bit, not flash, flashy type of guys, just guys that visited Oregon State, liked Corvallis, committed and stuck to their business and uh, stayed out of the way when it comes to um, reporters and news and things like that. So when they got up to East Lansing over the weekend, it was kind of refreshing talking to a lot of those kids. Um, a lot of those kids are dual sport athletes. Tight end Wyatt Hook out of San Jose, he told me uh, he's going to enroll in the spring because he's got golf season coming up, and he's also got basketball season. Um, there's – I'm not I'm blanking off the top of my head who it was, but there's wrestlers in this class. There's players who ran track. Um, and Jonathan Smith up at the press conference today said when he was talking about Makai Frazier, he mentioned that running backs better have defensive film. Um, he didn't mention it just like that, but I'm paraphrasing. But that's something that I think is interesting. And they like, they're going after versatile, dual sport type of athletes. And those guys usually develop well along the line. And also another aspect with the dual – sport guys is they haven't had time to focus on one sport yet and a lot of times that makes a big difference when you get in the weight room and focus on the playbooks and things like that narrowing down to one sport at the college level is when a lot of guys usually do make a big leap in their game Did you catch that he said about Frazier he said something like they better have defensive film I must have been typing some yeah I, I caught I it it, it was quote. it was such a it was such a it was such a throwback to D'Antonio you know you think of like I remember those like those pre signing day press conferences with him you know you think about Olivia and Bell he didn't get an, he didn't get a scholarship offer as a running back by Central Michigan. He was going to go to Central Michigan as a linebacker, you know, and, and Michigan State brought him in as a, as a running back, gave him the opportunity to as a short yardage guy. I look at Makai Frazier, and they had a USC bound running back and Brian Jackson ahead of him. Uh, they had a they had a, a pretty dang good, um, you know, like quarterback, a running quarterback, dual threat guy. So he wasn't getting a lot of carries. They needed him at more his high at his high school, McKinney High. They had five, uh, F, they had five power five guys signed today. Um, but it's one of those powerhouse programs that that they had they had him playing every snap they could on defense because he was better at defense than Brian Jackson was. That's you know, good, the, the running back, good linebacker. And uh, you know, at the end, his his coach, who's now I don't know where he's going, but he's not at that program anymore. I'm assuming he's moving up because he did so well uh, in Texas high school football, which is a rat race. But he was saying at the end, a lot of schools are coming in after he committed to Michigan State as a running back 
continuing to inquire after him as a, as a linebacker before they thought he was undersized, but he plays firm, he plays nasty. Yeah. And, uh, and, and he I, runs the ball that way too. And he does, man. And, I, and one of the things that those guys in Texas, uh, those coaches talk about is uh, Keith Bonafa, the running backs coach, about how good he is at developing talent, what his reputation is. They remember him all the way back from Boise State, some of the Texas guys they had there. Um, you know, Damian Martinez at Oregon State, that's a dude who's a Texas guy from that. Um, Dallas area, the suburb, like the same area. He's about a half hour away from McKinney, Texas, where okay. Frazier is. And so, you know, Martinez is a big time All American type at Oregon right. State. And, uh, and you look at some of the other guys that, that Bonafa has, uh, you know, developed. I, I had the I had the Boise State UCLA game on the other night, and uh, and like the Genty kid. Um, you know, who's, I don't know if he's starting or not for Boise State, but I'm like, dang, that kid is way better running back than people realize. Someone's coached him up. And, uh, you know, so Michigan State, and that high school coach from McKinney said that, uh, you know, that Michigan State has a real asset in, uh, in Bonafa as a running backs coach. He called him one of the best out there as a developer of talent, and he feels really comfortable sending his kids here. And that's something like, you know, so the dual threat, the dual nature of these guys, the fact that they've been communicated with, you know, on a, on a personal level with their, with the recruiting coaches, you look at the kid that was committed to Utah State, uh, you know, the Ryland Jesse kid, you cannot get that stuff to work unless you really are communicate, communicating and being honest with kids. And this coaching staff is honest, like D'Antonio's staff was. It reminds me a lot of, uh, you know, like some of the stuff you'd see in uh, Maverick Hansen. You know, we've got a spot for you if a couple guys fall through. We really want you. We think you, you can play at this level. If you come here, you will have an opportunity to, to play. Um, you will have opportunity to work and maximize your potential. So it's not a sales pitch. It's not saying we can get you the NFL or, or you know, this or that or all the kind of stuff that Mel Tucker was selling, the snake oil. It's real stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and talking to the high school kids, talking to their coaches, um, the genuine relationship-based recruiting, it's a big deal out there in this climate with everything being as transactional as it is. Uh, there's a lot of high school coaches that I've talked to that trust the guys on this Michigan State coaching staff, and that's going to pay dividends in a place like mm -hmm. Northeastern Ohio where guys really, really care about the guys that play for them, the guys that are basically family. And look how Maverick Hansen, how functional he was and how many innings he pitched, Still pitched when, when they needed that from him. That's a guy that was dying to come to Michigan State, 11th hour, got him to flip from Western or Central or something like that. And you and you might say he's not an All American, okay? But you need about ten or fifteen Maverick Hansons on a roster, and Smith is going to be valuing those type of guys. You got to go in a couple minutes before we get before we go. Jaden Walker, linebacker from Portage, is a guy that I think is vastly underrated. Now he committed to Bowling Green, and then Michigan State offered him in September. Har Harlan Barnett offered him. Credit to Barnett on that. Um, they looked at senior film, which is a an, an, a lost art. Another D'Antonio thing. You know, I mean, they, he was on the radar. Committed to Bowling Green, some senior the first two or three weeks of senior film, and if you watch his film, the guy's quick. He's he's uh, listed at about six three or so, um, very well coached. You know, in terms of the way he blows up blocks, same foot, same shoulder, just like disengages and pursuit speed. I mentioned earlier that he's taller and as fast as Antoine Simmons was, and Antoine Simmons was the, was the number six player in the state. Jaden Walker is that type of player, and Simmons was a good college player. Um, for him to be ranked number 21 in the state, but, but previously he's like 28 or so. Uh, you know, sometimes people need to go back and watch senior film and, and update rankings and so forth. I am not shocked that USC came in late, got an offer, got a, offered him, got a visit from him, and he's, he's been committed to Michigan State for a long time. But I'm not surprised USC came after him. He did not sign today. You might not be able to tell us all that's going on with that whole situation, but Jaden Walker, how important is he to add to this class? And your thoughts on his recruitment, what's going on there? Yeah, Jaden Walker is a big recruit for Michigan State heading into the last signing day now, and having Brady Pretz left in the fold helps, but they still want to have Walker, and linebacker's a position of need. And uh, Walker was on campus the first weekend of December with Michigan State. He uh, has a really close bond with other commitments, Nick Marsh and the Lunieski twins. Um, and I think those relationships and things like that will bode well in Michigan State's favor as now he's home from USC. He took an official visit there the weekend after he was at Michigan State. And I'm told that people in his circle really do love USC. Um, there's people in his circle that are infatuated with the West Coast, and um, they, they're they really excited about the USC offer. And it's hard to blame the kid, especially, as you mentioned, being committed in the MAC until September. 
Uh, he never really had a full recruitment with Power 5 schools chasing after him. And with this lady interest from USC, I think it's really sparked his interest. Um, from talking to people with close to him, I think Jaden has a really good head on his shoulders, so he's going to handle this respectfully. And um, right now he's kind of just torn between Michigan State and USC. Michigan State, with the proximity factor, obviously can maybe possibly get him back on campus in July, or January, I mean, uh, before he signs in February, and that'll be really tough for USC to do. I think as the visit to USC wears off, things will look better for Michigan State, but uh, they're definitely a school to watch, and uh, he's definitely interested in USC. Here's the problem. Um, now that he's extended it and hasn't signed, there's going to be other USC's coming after this guy if they look at his film. I wouldn't be surprised. I know a lot of schools value the portal, and they might go to the portal first. Um, and I don't want to put ideas in anybody's head. Not that any recruiting coordinators across the country are watching this, but Walker's that good. I think I, and this is another case of an old adage is you don't want to be guilty of jumping over dollar bills to pick up dimes. This is a dollar bill right here. And to Harlan Barnett's credit, it's close to home, looked at the junior senior film, and they, but the problem is USC is, and that is coming after him, and that's a, it's a good old-fashioned recruiting battle, Paul. That's a better problem to have than have him commit and sign today, I mean, with USC. You know, I, yes. I mean, that's a, that's the thing. Like, if you've got people in your family that are infatuated with that. The thing that hurt Michigan State with him being in that first weekend of, of December with the official visit is Joe Rossi was not part of the recruiting effort. And, and I think Joe Rossi is a dude that's really down to earth. He connects really well with players. If Walker is able to build a relationship with Joe Rossi based on the kind of guy he is, I think that Michigan State's in good shape. But if he had, you know, I, I think the biggest concern, yeah, other teams could come in. But my concern would have been is if he signed with USC today. The other thing is, is you know, you look at historically the way recruiting has gone in, in the state of Michigan. A kid like that should have been a it should have been a battle between Notre Dame, Michigan, and Michigan State, with Ohio State possibly coming in there. When you look at so, some of the battles that have happened at Portage Northern in the past, but I mean that's that's where I think, you know. People are sleeping on certain sections of the state. And uh, I mean, Kalamazoo, Battle Creek, it's not like it was when it was TJ Duckett was there and Little John Flowers and those guys, but that guy's a good ball player. And uh, you know, you look at guys that are, have the frame to be the size linebackers that, that Mel Tucker said he wanted, that guy should have been. And Walker's quick and he's athletic. He plays a slot linebacker in high school. And I think he could translate to being a slot linebacker in college. And, you know, Rossi's defense can go from a 4-3 to a 4-3 to 4-2-5, depending on who you're playing. You know, if you're playing Michigan, um, are they calling? All right, Jason's got to go. He's got to do a talk show in Grand Rapids. Is it, do you ever, do you want to go in that room, see if anyone's in there? Just find your, find some area and, 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 and do your thing. And there goes Jason. Great to have him here. He's doing I mean, a great job. To me, it reminds me of like, you Walker? Know, Walker reminds me of a Tawan Jones type of dude. The guy that, you know, like with Tawan Jones, he started out at that at that star linebacker, kind of slot linebacker position, then became a middle linebacker as he became physically mature. He ended up being a really good one. Had a cup of coffee in the NFL. Uh, really good linebacker. But he's if he fills out and he maintains the athleticism, he's going to be a really dynamic uh, college player. But I, th I think Michigan State's really lucky that USC didn't seal the deal this weekend. He's got good change of direction, not only to follow the ball, but also a little slight change of direction to, to, uh, to get off a block. He can get off a block physically, but he can also do it with agility, throwing it all together, nice player. Um, another underrated player here. I mentioned earlier that I think Jaden Walker is as, is as good as Antoine Simmons was, a top 10 player in the state. I think Walker could be, I think I consider him a top 10 player in the state. And there's good players in the state, nothing against some of the others. Wyatt Hook, yeah, tight end from California, 6'6", 230. All right, this guy's ranked number 114 in California. I'm telling you, you watch this guy catch radius for days. Hands Ball skills. Ball and skills. Cut um, in his past uh, – his pass routes at the top of his route makes good cuts, ball skills, hands. And when they tackle him, old Tuck will remember this, Bob Oregon. Bob Oregon was a tight end I here in 1993. He was the most difficult guy to tackle I've ever seen. He looked like, you know, the world's biggest fifth grader out on recess with six yeah, kids. Yeah, but dude, he fell forward, man. He, he was could like never tackle. He would have like six guys on him. as he like, Wyatt, like, a, like an oak tree falling forward every single time. I, I realize Wyatt Hook has a lot to – of growing into his body at six at six six two thirty, but there's some Bob Oregon highlights for, in terms yeah. of people having trouble tackling him. All right, number one fourteen in California. I love Brendan Parachek as a as a as a prospect as a true freshman at Michigan State right now. Parachek was number nine in the state of Michigan last year. If Wyatt Hook were in the state of Michigan, 
I think he'd be a top 10 player. Number 119, number 114, California, whatever. The guy's a tight end. He's got hands. And these guys coming in from Oregon State did a great job with tight ends at that program. They're going to highlight the tight end position at Michigan State. A lot of two tight ends, a lot of outside zone. He's got to show he can block, and he'll be working on that. And these guys are going to coach him up on that. But Wyatt Hook out of California, San Jose, real nice addition to this class yeah he's in the silicon valley area and that's not necessarily a football powerhouse area um i had a chance to talk to his high school coach who played defensive back at alabama back in the day his high school coach is crusty he reminds me of like you know he's not like a guy you'd expect from the silicon valley area and he's like always like you know he looks at Wyatt hook is like a you know a second son so he's always harping on him about what you need to do better you know what you need to get better at you know competing at the next level all the issues you're going to face but I look at like a guy like Wyatt Hook, and he's one of my favorite players in this class because of not, the frame. And he's a weird dude. Like I, you mentioned, the Bob Oregon comparison. It's weird because he has growing into his body to do, but he's always been bigger than everyone else around him. You know, and I think one of the things I appreciate about Wyatt Hook is even though he's always been bigger than the guys around him and faster in some some ways, um, he hasn't rested on his laurels. You know, so you talk about the world's biggest fifth grader, eighth grader comparison. To me, a lot of those guys are guys that rest on their athleticism you can tell with Wyatt Hook that he continues to work and the way he catches the ball with his hands the routes that he runs Mm -hmm. nobody blocks like a tight end in in high school because it's so hard to teach you know they put everybody either split them out wide or put them in the slot or whatever and and that that school did put him in as an h-back at times I know in talking to the high school coach that they didn't have all of his blocking film on there uh, but he's got the frame to block, and, and that's a lot different than than some of the guys that we've seen as big, bigger, slower wide receivers that have the narrow shoulders and don't have the ability to be blocking tight end. The fact that this is a tight end friendly offense, they know that they can recruit tight ends, and the fact that they made him a consistent early recruiting priority tells me a lot about what Oregon State thinks that they have in Wyatt Hook, and uh, I, I think he's another piece of evidence that shows me that the tight end position is going to be just fine at Michigan State. And I think Michigan State, with, with the coaching staff, with the offense that they run, is going to develop into a school uh, that consistently puts tight ends in the NFL. And that, that just feeds on itself. Once mm-hmm. you get one or two of those guys in there, it keeps on going. Uh, these guys do it the right way. I love the way that they, the, the Oregon State offense, the cohesion between the, in the run game operation. And uh, if you don't block – you're not playing tight end. You know, even Jack Velling, a dude that's a transfer coming in, dang good offensive player. You know, you compare him to Josiah Price, and I think that's a good apt comparison, but he's a much better blocker, in my opinion, than Josiah Price was. And they're not going to let you not block at Oregon State, which is now they're not going <clears> to <throat> not let you block at, at Michigan State. Um, you know, a guy like Malik Carr, uh, it, this would have been a terrible fit for him because he's not on the field unless he's blocking. For Jonathan Smith, and uh, I think Wyatt Hook is a guy that's going to fit that bill. Um, I think also it's maybe not a bad thing that he's not coming in early. That was the debate with him and his coach. His coach wanted him to push, get in there early, uh, be on campus early, and, and Hook wanted to play out his basketball season, play out his golf season. And for a guy at a developmental position like tight end, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing, especially when you've got a guy like Velling come, coming in. Um, I, I think why Hook's going to be a good one. But there's several guys in this class that I think maybe it's not a bad idea that they're coming in late. And, and I'm starting to think that there's some guys you want coming in early, but some guys I think that counteracts what you want to do by bringing them in early, especially if they're not going to be ready to play in that first year. Mm-hmm. Now, Wyatt Hook, um, I, a, a lot more skilled than Bob Oregon was. Nothing against Bob Oregon. Bob Oregon was just a big – 1993, you know, square shoulder guy that was difficult to tackle, but this guy can plant his foot and make catches and all those things. I was mentioning an old Tuck a minute ago. He's an old Bob Oregon fan. Old Tuck calls in the Spartan Mag Live show, and if you watch the Spartan Mag Live show, you know who Old Tuck is. But what were you going to say? Were you going to say something else? Well, I just there's a lot of guys in this class that I like. And it, going back to you know, I hate the, the D'Antonio comparisons, but there's so much similarity between the way they went about stuff, the way they evaluated, the way they believed in their own evaluations. You know, the, the way that they're like, okay, I see this guy. He's my priority. Um, you know, he might not be ranked as highly as someone else, but you, there's a lot of tight ends ranked higher than, than Wyatt, Wyatt Hook. But they know what they want in this offense, and they went after him. And I think uh, that decided – They snuck him out of San right. Jose. 
but the but the evaluation, you know, and I'll go back to another one talking to Austin Clay's coach. The evaluation that they did with uh, wide receiver from Ohio. Go ahead. R- right, the evaluation they did with him is really good. And then on the flip side, the coach says that he is a good fit for Michigan State's offense in what what they did at Oregon State. You know, his speed, uh, his toughness. Um, you know, him him being a guy that can get over open, open over the top ball skills so you know like that's one thing i really appreciate about ohio is not only are you know michigan state coaches looking for guys that fit them ohio high school coaches are looking for good fits for their players and and i think that's another reason why you know when i talked about coaches being on the ground networking with high school coaches i've always found that in ohio and it's like this in a lot of places but ohio especially they want their players to be successful they want their guys to uh to fit programs and you know i'm sure there's other guys in the area that they would say hey Jonathan Smith, Courtney Hawkins, he's not not a good fit. Um, Austin Clay, he's a dude that's he's skinny, um, but I'm not going to say he's B.J. Cunningham, but there's similarities between him and a, and a B.J. Cunningham when I look back and you see a guy from Ohio that was a little bit underrated because he played basketball and he played travel basketball in the summertime. And Ohio is the one state, in my opinion, my personal opinion, where wide receivers that play basketball and play travel basketball uh, into the summer tend to get overlooked. That's one kind of a blind spot in Ohio. But this is a first-team All-Ohio wide receiver. Um, you go back and you watch the, the first couple highlights of his huddle film, and that's against Cleveland, Cleveland Heights. Um, you know, he had 129 yards against Cleveland Heights. He had a 79-yard touchdown in there, and he also had a, a return uh, for a touchdown. Cleveland Heights is a team that puts power five guys out every single year. Michigan State was always in there, uh, you know, recruiting Cleveland Heights back in the D'Antonio era. So this isn't chopped liver that these guys are doing it against. And he's a first team all Ohio receiver. I mean, that, that means something, Jim. I like him, 6'1", 170. As an athlete, I think he's less B.J. Cunningham, big body guy, and more yeah. of a Jaden Reed type athlete. That, that's, that's a good – I'm just saying in terms of basketball yeah. and why, why they're flying on the radar. But the Jaden Reed comparison is really good. He's a track dude. Uh, he's a guy like skinny like Jaden Reed was. Um, and I think once, you know, like he's a guy that's playing basketball right now, he's a dang good point guard too. He's going to lead, probably lead that school as an all-time steals leader, all-time assists leader at that school. And the other thing about him is he's like one of those dudes that's almost always, every single game he has, almost a triple-double threat, you know, 12 points, eight rebounds, and, and type of stuff. You don't see runaway dunks because he's not flashy. But there's no doubt in my mind that he could dunk two-handed if he wanted to. He's got sticky hands. He's a hands catcher. Mm-hmm. That's something recruiting analysts don't pay enough attention to. Mm-hmm. And, and this, is a, this is a guy that, you know, there's a high care factor there, and uh, I, I think he's going to be. I think he's going to be pretty dang good. And, and he gets up to speed quickly, like Jaden Reed, like off the line of scrimmage or in a punt return, catches it and gets up to speed quickly. So, now Jaden Reed, you know, a tremendous world class play finisher. That's why he's in the NFL. Remains to be seen whether he has that kind of special talent. Right. But as an athlete, he's kind of in that Jaden Reed category. So and he was committed to what Bowling, Bowling Green. Green. Yeah. And Michigan State gets on him late, flips him in Ohio. Pragmatic makes sense. Michigan State needs wide receivers. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and, and I mean that was one of the deals. Courtney Hawkins and some Michigan State coaches reached out to coach high school coaches in the in the northeastern Ohio area with a list of guys that they thought maybe would be good fits for them. You know, so so they're talking to high school coaches if you're in the northeastern Ohio area. You know, this coach uh, Jonathan Hunek was at Lakewood St. Ed's when the Dolls were there. You know, he was the offensive coordinator there back in 2015 when Michigan State was the king in Ohio besides Ohio State. You know, able to pull guys out against Notre Dame, pull guys out against Michigan. And, uh, you know, this coach was like, yeah, this is a guy that fits you. He's going to be, you know, he's the he's, coach told me that he's one of the best kids he's ever been around, one of the hardest workers. And they're really excited that Michigan State is back active, evalu- like doing real evaluations on Ohio area talent. This is a guy that the high school coach said Michigan State saw him at satellite camps, ignored him. Coach sent film to Michigan State on multiple occasions. He was completely ignored during the recruiting process. But to Courtney Hawkins' credit, when they went out and they were asking about uh, you know, prospects, potential guys that could fit Michigan State because they want to get inroads back into northeastern Ohio, this is the guy that the coaches in that area were pitching. And it's not just one coach, it's other coaches, you know, bearing witness to the fact that, hey, this guy's a real deal. And that's how they got Le'Veon Bell years ago, yeah. networking in, in Ohio. Yeah, I mean, that was Mike Trestle, uh, you know, networking in Ohio, but also having an inside tip from his dad, Dick mm-hmm. Trestle, who was running backs coach at Ohio State um, at the time. They liked, Ohio State really liked um, Le'Veon Bell, didn't have room for him, and uh, 
I think Le'Veon Bell or Makai Frazier kind of reminds me of Le'Veon Bell a little bit. Now with Austin Clay, number 39 in Ohio, by on three, number 51 in the consensus rankings. Um, number three wide receiver in Ohio. Number one wide receiver in Ohio is Tremar Harris, Cincinnati Winton Woods, who's going to, to Purdue. And Harris, bigger body guy, but he is a body catcher. You're talking about Clay. Clay's a hands catcher, and there's a distinction. If you're a body catcher, you're going to have to learn to catch with your hands. I know that sounds stupid. Benny Fowler ended up being an NFL player, Super Bowl and all that. Took a while. But he was initially a body catcher, and it took him a while. So Jamar Harris, going to Purdue, has ability and has a frame, but uh, this guy ranked number three receiver behind him. Clay, in some ways, is a little more polished and is explosive. Number two receiver is Dalen Wilkins, 6'3", out of Northmont, Ohio. He's committed to Eastern Michigan. He's, He's big, one. fast, smooth, hands, very good. Not sure how Eastern Michigan got that guy, but Dalen Wilkins is a different – he's a different – it's apples and oranges when you talk about a 6'3 receiver and a guy like Clay. They're both good, but Clay a number three receiver in Ohio. I can buy that, but number one going to Purdue has got some work to do, but Clay is a good one. Yeah, he belongs in the Big Ten. And you know the thing about – you look at Winton Woods, that was an old stop ground for Michigan State. They didn't always get guys from there. In fact, they didn't, but they, they were always in the top two or three for those dudes. Sometimes they got beat out for Notre Dame. If Michigan State wanted to go into to a Winton Woods, I know Harlan Barnett, obviously not sure what his role is right now, but that's a guy that the Michigan State could have made a pursuit of, especially with Purdue's you know, status with wide receivers right now because the offense hasn't been good. Um, you know, it's it's down a, down a little bit, but you look at I mean, you look at at, at Hawkins. I'm sorry, not Hawkins, but um, the kid from uh, Clay. Yeah, you, Bria Midpark, um, just a really good athlete, and you can see it on the basketball court when he's doing when he's in transition. He is slight. He's like 170 would be generous right now. But when he when he's contacted, he stays square and and he's able to finish and transition. You see the same thing in the football field. There's a couple times where he's hit way early when he's going up trying to high point the ball, and he's still able to maintain that concentration. One of the things his coach said to me is that not only is he a good hands catcher, but his eyes are always in the right place. The eye discipline that he plays with on both sides of the football is impressive. The thing that he's gonna that maybe makes this a really apt comparison with Jaden Reed, he's gonna really struggle initially with with those uh, man-to-man release moves off the line of scrimmage and, and Jaden Reed it took time for him um, I, I think to develop the strength that he needed to, to get those release moves but um, that's that's where it's going to take weight room work for him and it's going to take a, a little bit for him to to you know live up to his his ceiling but it's a high one. All right, high school signing day that's only part of it. the transfer portal a big part of it. What I like about the transfer portal from Michigan State so far they've got five transfer commitments and to me they're all like proven functional college football players they aren't somebody's third string four star who used to be a prospect and it's not like you know tucker i mean he was aggressive and they and uh, you know he had a vision for it and and the number of portal transfer they went heavy into the I portal think it was a lack of vision and the, they went heavy into the portal and the number of portal players that actually panned out it wasn't a real high percentage now they went great and got kenneth walker in year one that's kind of like winning your first hand of blackjack you know, then you think you're going to win all your hands. And Michigan State was bringing in 20 a year. You know, you know, third string guys from Wisconsin, third string guys from, uh, you know, Auburn and all that stuff. Michigan State has five, and they're going to get more. And I'm not saying they're all going to pan out that they get in the future. Aiden Childs, everybody loves him as a prospect, right? T.J. Sheffield coming yeah. in from Purdue. Was he have 100 career receptions? I mean, Michigan State needs he's wide got, receivers. He's got 100 plus receptions, and he's got over a thousand receiving yards, and he's done it every single year. You look at a lot of the portal guys, they have like two years and then a down year and then they hit the portal. This guy has done it every single year and he's done it in different different offenses. This is a steal. And Michigan, Michigan State, State needs receivers. And some of the receivers they've lost into the portal, this guy's better than those guys right. that they've lost. Um, Sheffield is a great addition. It's 5'11", originally from Tennessee. I, you know, Michigan State went, in, went out there and got that guy. Jordan Turner, Michigander from Farmington, spot starter at Wisconsin. You know, big, he has some good size at like 6'1", 225, something like that. There, uh, you know, some of his old coaches are excited about him getting a chance at Michigan State. Michigan State needs linebackers. Solid chance Jacoby Winman's going to come back. You have Turner in there. Jordan Hall, solid chance he's coming back. Things are sounding good there. Halliday, we talked about this in the basketball game the other day. That, that gives you a chance to have a linebacker room which a month ago I wasn't sure was going to happen, but a guy that's played college football and functioned. Jack Velling, 
tight end of the year in the Pac-12. Of course, he's coming with the Oregon State guys. They know who he is. That's a no-brainer. We talked about him. And today, the big news, like Quindarius Dunnigan, Edge, Middle Tennessee State, second team, all Conference USA. That's what I'm talking about. I, I, if, I'm a, if I'm a coach or putting together a roster, I'm, first of all, looking at all conference mid-majors. That's for you, Matt that's what, Dorsey. That's what Jacoby Winman was. I don't need former four-star you know, divas that are coming in from Auburn, Alabama, and Georgia, and Florida. That, that might look good in the funny pages, and they might fill the shirt well, like Greg Brady, the old episode 40 years ago, dating myself with that. Now, you could add a few of those at some point, but the five that they have so far, they're not just throwing around scholarships like, you get a scholarship, you get a scholarship, you get a scholarship. Let's get rid of all these guys. We're going to the portal. No, they're doing it methodically, effectively, intentionally, to use a, a word from the last couple of years. But I like, I think all five of these guys are guys that can function. Yeah, and you look at, you know, you look at Jordan Turner, man. He's got a connection to the state of Michigan. You know, like, I know that Michigan State has done that a little bit in terms of some of the portal guys uh, the last couple of years. But every one of these guys is, is connected and is vetted. You know, I don't know enough about, you know, Quindarius uh, Duggins, but um, I'll tell you what, I, watching some of, the, some of the Minnesota film, and I mentioned this to you earlier today, and I, I really believe it. You know, like some of the things that, that Joe Rossi does on, with the defensive line, they do some, you know, you know they do some, some nice stuff where you've got defensive ends dropping and whatnot. But he's got a linebacker background, had 100, 100 and some tackles his senior year in, uh, at Chattanooga, uh, at a high school in Chattanooga. Um, he started out as an outside linebacker at Middle Tennessee State. That's kind of like, you know, like what he's practicing, he grew into a defensive end, so he's got some. So he's got a better idea of what some what to do in space. I, I think when you look at his stats this year, the thing that stood out to me is he led the country among defensive linemen in pass breakups. So that tells me that he can play in space and he's got a good anticipation and he kind of sees sees things really well. He's got a good reaction thing. That's going to help take away some of the around the line of scrimmage stuff. Uh, and and it tells me also you can't have eight PBUs as a defensive end unless you're disciplined. And, you know, you look at some of the guys that Michigan State has brought in on the defensive line, um, defensive ends, you know, I'm, like, to me, see a day late. Now, you win a press conference with that guy. You don't win a ball game with that guy. And he lacked discipline. He fit the shirt. You know, and he was a guy that it sounds great. You can control the C-gap. Bull crap. And, uh, and I don't know what that was based on. Nothing against him. Because it's, ba it's based there was on no, – there was, There's more film of Sasquatch than there was of the fact that he's, It's based on the fact that he's 300 pounds and he, you know, and he can run around. And he was a five-star when he was a junior right. in high right. school. Right. So this, going back to the stuff that we're talking about. Nothing against like, him, but – Real evaluation. Real evaluation about what you can do on a football field. Um, you know, there's a lot of guys out there, you know, like that, except for Jalen Thompson, the defensive line class. You know, I mean, you look at those guys and it's like all hype. Yeah, number one line defensive line class in the Big Ten are one of the best. Uh, one of the reasons why Michigan State's recruiting class was ranked number four in the conference last year was the defensive line class. But it's full of posers in some ways. You know, like, and it's like, okay, is By Job going to help you this year? When is he going to help you? Is it worth paying six figures for a guy like that just to get a top 25 recruiting class? And when I see guys like Quindarius Duggan, Duggan, Duggan coming in, he's coming in because he wants to – because there's a position in need, and he's a guy that I know is going to be able to play it if he's, if he's, if he's healthy. Matt Dorsey, our longtime friend, uh, the OG of uh, Spartan Mag football recruiting coverage, I, you know, he's a big proponent of the lower-level football, the MAC-level football. Those guys are ascendant. You want guys on the rise, not the retreads, not the guy that's been – that started out at Alabama, went to Liberty, and is a graduate transfer, has played maybe 10 games as a, as a third stringer, and then decides to come to your school, and you're like, yeah, he's a 300-pounder. I want guys that you can build. I want guys that can produce. And I think Dunnigan's got two years left, so that's a big deal. It's, it's, I agree. It's more of a pragmatic approach to the portal. Um, and Michigan State needs to make use of this portal because they've lost a lot of players and they're trying to revamp the, the roster without going like cold, totally full bore portal. But um, they're, they're uh, frugal with these portal offers and all five of those guys make sense. Yeah, I mean, because Jonathan Smith's got the attitude and his staff does as well as they want to be stewards of the program. Plus, if you're bringing in, if you're, if you're blanket offering the portal, what, and, you're and you're saying that your message is a player, you want to be a player development program, what does that tell those guys? If you're bringing in selective guys that you know can help you right away and saying, 
to the guys in the high school ranks, okay, we're bringing in this one guy because he can help us right away, but you're going to develop and you're going to have a place in this program. That makes a whole lot more sense, and that makes your program a whole lot less transactional. You have to use the portal, but you got to do it effectively. You can't pay a guy like Jarek Broussard to be uh, six figures to be your fourth leading rusher. It just does not make sense. And I, I, don't think, I don't think Jonathan Smith's the kind of guy, I don't think the coaches on the staff are the kind of guys that, that are going to waste resources. They come from a program without a lot of them. They've learned, like Mark Antonio did when he was at Cincinnati, to use resources effectively. And, uh, and I won't say these guys are good stewards of the program, and it's shown with the guys that they've offered. There's not reaches out there. More and more indications that he's a good fit. More and more indications that Jonathan Smith enjoys being here, and he's in, in, in enjoying getting some of this uh, potential energy um, angled in the right direction. I think, there's a pro I think when you listen to him and you saw, you know, he's not going to blow smoke. He's not, gonna, he's not a hype guy. But I could tell in him talking about, like, being pleasantly surprised, or however he phrased it, with with the recruiting class, or how effective they were, I think it went better than he expected. You know, being a new guy to the Midwest, being a guy that didn't know these, you know, didn't know a lot of stuff, being a guy that didn't have a defensive coordinator in place for a week and a half on on the job. I mean, the way Michigan State was able to do this, this is phase one. They're going to continue to ad address in different ways, and I honestly think because of the transfer portal, because of how many guys are going out there, that there are quality for your Maverick Hanson type of players out there if you look hard enough. And they're going to have to look under rocks, and they're going to have to watch senior film like Mark D'Antonio did incessantly when trying to, to fill those last few spots in the, in the roster. And maybe there will be some guys out there that end up being NFL players like Mark D'Antonio brought in late a lot of times. And the reason we mentioned senior film is a lot of these scholarship offers nationwide are based on junior film exactly. and camps and so forth. So the senior film a lot of times gets pushed aside, but there's some guys in this class that are part of that senior film. Um, Jonathan Smith, um, we're seeing more and more, you know, when Alan Haller talked about when Jonathan Smith first got here, Alan Haller had lunch or dinner. It was Izzo, Haller, and Smith. And as Haller listened to Smith and Izzo talk, Haller said he just got a bigger and bigger smile on his own face knowing that he was the right guy. Because if, if you're Alan Haller or a Michigan State person that's been around here for a long time, it takes a certain type of mindset and ethic to get it going at Michigan State. And Haller was looking for that type of guy, knew he had that type of guy, knew it even more after listening to him with Izzo. And as every day goes by, um, a, a guy that can uh, – that. Uh, can make it work in the landscape at Michigan State, which is not easy, but it can be done. And 23 days in, do not underestimate the fact that, like you said, and like Smith said today, having to hire a defensive coordinator, a very important decision. And the candidates that he went over and the interviews, within those, the 22-day period that he also has, has to put together his first recruiting class, the time that that took to do those things at the same time, um, if I, you know, there's other coaches around the country that have a harder time recruiting to their school, but in terms of juggling a lot of things in 22 days, nobody in the country had more work to do than he did. Yeah, absolutely. And the, the, that coordinator's pretty solid. Joe Ross is a great, is a great pick, and, and Lindgren's a really good coordinator, the offensive coordinator. One of the things I wanted to say is, like, we talk about them being a player development program, and I posted about this on the message board today, uh, this morning. Part of being a player development program is identifying guys that fit your program. And identifying those guys effectively because you can't develop players within the construct of what you are doing scheme wise on either side of the ball unless you really get out there and do your homework uh, you talk to people not just you know not just high school coaches not I mean not just trainers or you know or hype men or that type of stuff but high school coaches teachers um, whomever basketball coaches other high school coaches in the area that's how you find out whether guys are really going to fit what, what you think think they're going to fit and i got a feeling that that there's more watching of uh, continuous copy film in the evaluation process than just watching highlights because that's when you know uh you know whether guys are the real deal yeah. or whether they're taking plays off and uh you know going back to the austin clay's coach he said one of the things like you get when you get an Ohio high school football player, a kid from Northeastern Ohio, is you get a guy that cares about his teammates for the most part. There's exceptions to every rule. Works his tail off. He's not going to embarrass you, and he's going to play football the right way. That's what they strive to teach. Um, you know, and you look at Clay. I wanted to say this, too, because I forgot about it, but I want, when you watch his return film, yeah. it's so efficient. You know, you see a lot of guys like, you know, we've seen return film forever. I'm going all the way back to Johnny Adams. I think he had eight return touchdowns but he's running all over the place when 
when uh, that dude, when he runs back the ball, it's efficient. And, and uh, I think it's, you see the basketball player in him. You see the driver. You see the guy that understands where his lanes are. And, uh, you know, his eyes are in the right place, like I was talking about earlier. These, there's no reaches in this class. To, I mean, maybe there will be moving forward, but I really like what Michigan State did. Um, there's a lot of credibility. And usually if you take the time and get those kind of credible guys, if they're willing to work together, like we saw with D'Antonio's first class and some of the guys that stayed for a second class, I mean, you're able to accomplish bigger things than maybe your talent level should enable you to. I got some more opinions on a lot of these guys. Maybe we'll get to that in Spartan Mag Live or some other time, but we've, we've gone a long time here today. Paul, really appreciate your insight and your work. Uh, it's fun watching these initial days of a new regime coming in and trying to get their things going. It's, it's nice seeing team. It's nice seeing them appreciate. It's nice seeing a coaching staff, a head coach, appreciate the resources that he has and use them effectively, instead of like all the all the constant like chatter behind the scenes of, of you know if only I had this or if only I had that or if only we raised this amount of money. And you know I think one of the things that D'Antonio said to me when at Smith signing day when he was introduced as head coach is that in D'Antonio's research he. He learned that, that Smith is a guy that handles uh, difficult situations that come up unexpectedly in a, in a very um, measured and, uh, and stoic approach, but he's able to handle sudden change in, a, in unexpected events really quickly. And I, I think when D what Danny was, Tony was trying to say about that is like this is there's no other era of college football where there's more unexpected twists and turns with all the different moving parts that you've got uh, with a transfer portal. Uh, you know, NIL and all that, that type of stuff. But uh, Jonathan Smith seems to be like that steady at the rudder type of dude and or at the tiller. And, uh, you know, you can even see that today. He didn't overhype this class. He didn't, you know, predict that these guys are going to be in New Year's Day bowls or anything like that. But, he, you know, he said that they signed a class that met their needs to some extent for the first part of the recruiting class, and they're going to continue to work to meet those needs. And that's, that's refreshing. Instead of hearing, you know, let's talk about – this top 25 class that really shouldn't have been ranked in the top 25 because it didn't meet needs. Now, moving forward, they're absolutely going to have to replenish the four-year interior defensive line group, and that's that's something that we haven't talked a whole lot about today. But you go back to that Maverick Hanson. The one thing I appreciate about D'Antonio, if there was one scholarship left in any class, it was going to a guy that maybe could help them on the, in the interior defensive line. And Michigan State absolutely failed abjectly, miserably recruiting four-year interior defensive lineman and where Michigan State is at right when? now like during the years. during the Tucker era it never flagged during the Antonio era and you can see that by the fact that there's so many D'Antonio era guys that you know kind of towing the rope Simeon Barrow is still a guy that's holding up the tent and uh, they got to get back to doing what Michigan State did and not being portal um, you know not not being so portal heavy because right now Michigan State is in the same situation defensive line wise, interior defensive line wise, that they were at the end of the John L. Smith era with an over reliance on JUCO um, defensive linemen, and they got to break that cycle. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be what I'm going to be looking forward to in phase two. I don't know how many guys are out there, but they need to continue to bring in guys that they think can help out. And maybe this is like linebacker in the first year of the D'Antonio era. You know, he brought in Greg Jones. They needed way more linebackers than Greg, just Greg Jones, but they weren't going to bring in guys that they didn't think could get the job done. Maybe that's going to be the case with the interior defensive line. But Michigan State has to find ways to break that portal dependency on interior DL. Uh, it's absolutely critical for the for the long-term health of this program. And Jonathan Smith says they're going to continue to recruit their own players, some of them out of the portal. Right. I've heard that there's still discussions with Derek Harmon and Zion Young. I mean, those are guys that are that uh, other schools are very much interested That's, in. Because as they should be, because there's not a lot of those guys out there. It's hard to find good big men in the portal, and those are a couple that have been productive, and Michigan State is not in a situation where you can let productive big men get away. So there's still the discussions going on there. Uh, intriguing, and uh, I think you asked a question about Ohio. I know you asked a question about Ohio, and I think it was a, an answer to this. When he said he's looking forward to getting out there and meeting these coaches, he says, I haven't met a lot of them yet, but there, were, there was a genuine nature aspect to that which is what this program needs in terms of getting out there and learning who the coaches are and understanding the importance of that. Did you catch that? Yeah, and, and I think probably he has talked to some of those guys. I'm, I know that he's talked to some of, some of the guys in Ohio. And the one thing that I've always found refreshing about Ohio high school football coaches 
is they might have a rooting interest. And a lot of those guys grew up Ohio State fans or whatever. But they want, for, by and large, and, and I, there's exceptions always for this, but most of the guys that I've come across that coach in Ohio, they want what's best for their players. They want their players playing in programs that fit them best, that, that kind of lend themselves to be successful. And I, and I think one of the things that you see when you when you when you invest as a as a college football program in high school football coaches in listening to their opinion in in looking at their players they give back to you and uh, it's a, always been with Michigan State a very reciprocal relationship with Ohio State with Ohio you know high school football coaches D'Antonio and his staff did it better than anyone to the to the extent that you know like I mean they spent a lot of time down there and it, and it was a, and it was a good deal but Michigan State I don't know if they can get back to that level but there's a genuine interest, a genuine want by Ohio high school football coaches um, to get Michigan State back in there. And, and one of the things that, that, that Clay's coach told me, he's like, hey, there's, you know, look at how many Ohio guys that Michigan has right now. Yeah, that's how they began turning it around. Yeah, look at how many guys uh, that Michigan has from Ohio. It's one of the, one of the reasons they turned it around. Right, ahead. and he said, you know, he's like, they've got as many – probably as many as Ohio State has right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, he didn't come out and say that. That's the reason why that Michigan has been beating down Ohio State. I mean, there's other reasons for it as well. But he said that anybody that's not recruiting Ohio, anybody that thinks there's not talent in Ohio is just lazy. And Michigan State right now has fewer Ohio scholarship players on the football team than any time in history. Right. I mean, I can't go back and look at the 1930s roster. I'm sure they didn't have as many players, from, but percentage-wise, yeah. I can comfortably go back and say definitely in the 85 scholarship era and at least back in, into the mid-60s. They've never had this few Ohio I, players. I can't imagine. And the ones that they have are, are still D'Antonio recruits. The time that I spent that covering Michigan out. State football, even going back to the John L. Smith era, I can never remember a time when there was like less than 10 Ohio guys in a program. Uh, no. No. Yeah, I mean, it's ridiculous. You should have like 20, 25 to 30 Ohio guys every single year. And, you know, I was watching clip, one of the Clay's clips, you know, as a return guy. It's nasty weather out there. And he's going out hand catching a ball in cold and sleet and rain in traffic. Um, you know, that stuff, that stuff matters. And I don't usually make predictions about whether guys are going to be return men because I don't think it's like always very apt. Uh, for high school because it's a different trajectory. Uh, you've got different guys running down at you. But the way his eyes are, the way he stays square, his efficiency of movement and the way he sees the basketball floor, I would not be surprised if he turns into a really good return man at the college level. All right. Appreciate your, your insight, input, Paul. Appreciate all the subscribers. SpartanMag.com. Become a SpartanMag.com subscriber for continued analysis and coverage. Signing day in the in the February signing day and into spring practice. Portal coverage, basketball coverage, all of it. Become a magger. We'd love to have you over there. Are you going to say something? Last shout out, Noah Sprunger. He's done a great job. You know, we said Jason's done a great job. Noah's done a great job yeah. with so social media and, and getting on those those breaking stories and keeping us informed yeah. so we can balance some family stuff. Um, Jake Laskawa, uh, probably fantastic writer, good person, better person. Um, he's done some really good stuff for us. I really appreciate his help. And then Kenny, Kenny Jordan, who is here today. Kenny is dependable. He's been around. And uh, kudos to Kenny for staying through this whole Nick Marsh saga from the very beginning to the end. Um, but Kenny's done a nice job as well. So I really appreciate our younger staff members. Yeah. And, uh, and I, I need to remember to tell them that more often. Thanks for mentioning that. I, I usually say that in Spartan Mag Live, and I forgot to today. It's a very busy day. You guys did a great job this morning. And we'll have more to SpartanMag.com coming up. So uh, for Paul Konerdyke, Jason Killip, Kenny Jordan, Jake Laskawa, Noah Sprunger, and all the cast of thousands at SpartanMag.com, uh, appreciate all the people that are tuning in and, and giving us a like at the channel here, especially my guy, Conan Dyke and um, to all the subscribers. Thanks for tuning in. For Conan Dyke, my name is Jim Comproni, publisher of SpartanMag.com. You've been watching the VCast from Spartan Stadium on signing day with the Spartans and the future Spartans for SpartanMag.com.